Welcome everyone to Inside Academia, the weekly program where we take a look behind the ivory curtain, seeking a frank discussion of American education. I'm your host, Andy Nash. My guest today is Dr. Mark Bauerlein. After earning his doctorate in English from UCLA in 1988, he's taught at Emory University since 1989 and served as the director of the Office of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts between 2003 and 2005. While there, he contributed to the NEA study entitled Reading at Risk, a survey of literary reading in America. Still teaching English at Emory University and currently the author of the 2008 book, The Dumbest Generation, How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. I want to welcome you, Dr. Mark Bauerlein. Welcome to Inside Academia. Glad to join you. Thank you. Uh, uh, the overall thesis of your, of your book, uh, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory from the title, and you've uh, since written a number of blogs and columns and uh, entries and have been interviewed about it many times. You're claiming that the uh, excessive use of digital technology is essentially stupefying young Americans, young people. Uh, their attention spans are getting shorter, and uh, it seems as though that uh, they're not engaging in the in-depth type of uh, reading and critical thinking skills necessary uh, to go through school and to go through a successful college education. Uh, what, what was the impetus for your book? What, what prompted you to, to study all of this and to come to the conclusions that you, you've come to? And by the way, you're not alone among a team of authors that have written about the same thing, but what were your direct personal experiences? Well, I, I'm a teacher, and so the first access to youth uh, for me is through students, uh, students on college campuses. And then uh, when I worked in the government, I, I did get involved in researching issues of secondary students as well. And we've all lived through the digital revolution. Everything has changed in so many habits, media, uh, the way people spend their leisure time, the way classrooms have changed, and it, it affects everything. Now, you know, a man uh, was released from prison last year after being incarcerated for 30 or 40 years. And one thing they asked him was, well, what's really changed? What do you notice is different more than anything else? And Stephen Adams says, well, everyone's walking around with this thing, you know, in their, in their ear, and they're talking into this mouthpiece. I've never seen all the other cell phone stuff uh, going on. Now, we walk around and see these things, and we don't even notice any change in it because these things have swept into our lives and they're so beneficial, they're so convenient in so many ways that we simply absorb them very quickly without, I think, sufficiently reflecting upon what these tools mean for the nature of human experience, human interaction, and learning and study, our relationship to the past, our relationship to old media, it's all changed, and the young users, they're the ones who are registering this most severely. They're the digital natives. They're the early adopters. And I think that there was so much enthusiasm, so much hype, so much money going into the digital assimilation that we, we didn't have enough reflection enough critical scrutiny on, in spite of all the wondrous things that have happened, maybe some important things are being lost as well. And so when I would go into libraries and see every computer station occupied with some cheery or intent sophomore pounding out an email at a machine gun clip, and then go upstairs in the stacks, and it is deserted, See, this, this has to be talked about. This has to be registered. And so I proceeded to build up some research on, on the matter and, and, and compile a portrait of the lesser habits that have crept into young people's lives mm -hmm. and things that have been lost. Well, let me ask you, on the, on the point of what's been lost, I remember going through college, college years throughout the 1990s. I'm a Generation Xer, not a millennial. Uh, and throughout the decades, widespread cell phone use was just coming on the scene. And um, I remember I can make, for the most part, the same argument that many people didn't go to the library. They didn't pick up a book. They didn't read. Mass education, for the most part, was already in full effect after several decades post-World War II. And essentially, people were just going through the motions. 
many, many of them. Now, you can say that it was always the top 10 or 20 or 25 percent of students that are really contemplative, that really belong in college. They have the academic, intellectual, and scholastic abilities to become academics and to be really, truly intellectual thinking people. And if they pursued it, they did. But the rest of the folks went through the motions looking to get their ticket punched. Now, they weren't inundated by as much digital technology as kids today, but arguably you could say that they were no less intellectually lazy, if I may dare say that. So what effect is technology necessarily having that is actually making the kids of today that bottom 80 or 70 percent any dumber than, say, 20 years ago? Yeah, I think those are fair statements. Uh, young people haven't changed. I don't think that that's, that's the issue. I think the motivations of adolescents today are pretty much the same as the motivations 30 years ago before the digital age hit. 15-year-olds had their interests in peer pressure and peer absorption and peer fixations just like they did 30 or 40 years ago. <clears throat> and the previous generation wasn't super studious. They didn't spend all their time in the library. That, that's true. There are measures, however, that the amount of homework that students do in college has gone significantly downward. The rates of remedial instruction for reading and writing and math keep going up. They're going up a lot at a lot faster rate than the college attendance rate is going up. Uh, you have a shift toward majors that don't highlight humanistic understanding. You know, 40 or 50 years ago, half of all majors, half of all degrees were in one of the humanities fields. Now they're down to about 12, 13 percent of all degrees. So that there, there, there are some declining measures. Reading scores, for instance, for high school seniors, national reading scores have dropped significantly since the early 90s before the digital age hit heavy. Um, but, I, but I think your, your, your general point about intellectual motives and talents, they, they haven't deteriorated. Here's what's happened. Uh, in the old days, in a pre-digital world, youth culture was not a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week thing. When I would get up, and when I was 15, I'd go get up in the morning. My brother and I would go to school. We'd go to classes, hang out in the lunchroom with our friends. After school, we'd play some basketball. And then we'd go home at 6 o'clock. And that, in effect, ended our social interaction. There was the landline, as it's, as it's now called. There was one in the house. It was in the kitchen. Some kids would talk on the phone a lot. Most kids didn't. You could only talk to one person at that time. But I didn't think of, I'm going to go call some guys who I was just shooting hoops with. I came home and I had to hang around with my parents. I had to sit at the dinner table and listen to them complain about Richard Nixon. I had to listen to Walter Cronkite on the TV talking about Vietnam. I, I wasn't interested in those things. I didn't care. I was interested in sports and what's going on at school. But social life was suspended for the night. And then it would start up again the next morning when I would get back to school. So uh, what would happen is uh, I had to be exposed to adult matters, to non-social matters, just by virtue of sitting at the dinner table or the television offerings. Back in 1974, I couldn't come home and flip on the TV and have 12 different channels purveying content about my age group. There weren't, there were hardly any shows about my age group. There were small children's shows and then there were adult shows. Nothing in the teenage world really came in. In the late 70s, early 80s is when the teenage program started started hitting heavily, and then cable 
came along so that now you can come home if you're 15 years old, you can turn on the TV and find 12 different channels giving you youth stuff. Mm -hmm. You can go online now at any time, anywhere, virtually. Pull out your tablet and check into adolescent stuff. You can go up to your room, which used to be a private space, the bedroom for the teenager. And you could be secluded and isolated in there. Now, the bedroom is a social space. The, the, the 15 year old can go up to the bedroom and shut out the rest of the house and open up to the rest of the world. Uh, conduct, you know, do, do some chatting or, or emails or, or texting. And what this means is that the, the youth world, youth culture, adolescent social peer pressure goes on all the time and everywhere. Kids can conduct a social life sitting in the back of their parents' SUV while they're driving across Route 40 outside Tucumcari, New Mexico. It never stops. And the problem here is that youth culture is, by and large, anti-intellectual. It is anti-eloquence, anti-historical, it is fixated on the concerns of adolescence, the trends, the fashions, the, the idiom, the lingo, the music of 17-year-olds. And that world is adolescent. So w what has happened is that we've lost that adult pressure okay. in young people's lives, and we've got now peer pressure all the time and that this is uh, not harming their native intelligence. Mm -hmm. What it's doing is uh, uh, wrapping them up, absorbing them into adolescent concerns way too much through the adolescent years and delaying their recognition of things like what happened on the, on, on, on the mall in late summer 1963 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Who cares about that? I care about what happened last week at the party. The natural inclination of adolescence is toward narcissism and 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 the present and the, so what, the immediate triumphs. What effect does this have insofar as their their learning ability and the actual learning that that takes or doesn't take place, particularly in high school and higher education as well? What they do is divide their academic demands from their personal lives. So when they do U.S. history in 11th grade and they study the Civil War and they read the Gettysburg Address, the Gettysburg Address is simply something to know for the test. Mm -hmm. It is not something that has a personal meaning to them. Their personal lives are now so overwhelmed by this hyper-social existence they lead now, right. that it's just darn hard to relate to what an old guy said in 1863. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, I mean, academic achievement becomes all mercenary. Well, I've got to get this for the exam. Do this to get the test score. And once I've done it, well, the, the goodbye. Right. So where's the I sense don't, I don't of wonder and the sense of imagination and, and learning and the, the curiosity and the inquisitiveness that is supposed to come with learning? And, uh, Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. And also, and also the effect is, is also you could say that the effect is that they, um, they don't know how to compartmentalize all the different things in your lives. Whereas when you were growing up, you had playtime, you had school time, you had, uh, you had social time and you've had time that you had to spend with your fa family and the, you know, the village elders, as it were, you know, community leaders and so on and so forth. If you went to a civic association or a church or whatever and you belonged to something, you had to, you know how to act when you were within one group versus another and there were clear differences. Whereas kids today, it doesn't matter where they are, they're, they're interrupted by the text messages just came in and they're responding to it no matter where they are, who they're talking to. They're on all the time. And, you know, Nielsen media ratings came up. Uh, the last estimate was 3,300 text messages per month mm -hmm. on average by teenagers who, who have a, a mobile device of some kind. Uh, when Pew Internet 
did a study of teens and cell phones last year, the research were, researchers were amazed at the number of young people who sleep with a cell phone under the pillow on. They want it on so that if a text message comes through at 2 in the morning, it will wake them up. They need to respond now. That is pure pressure uh, to the nth degree. Mark, this and, is and the thing is, that, you know, the peer pressure has always been there. Uh -huh. It has a whole new arsenal now, and the cell phone, digital tools now, the Facebook page, are now a stream of peer pressure that is becoming profoundly significant to them. How, you know, you, you, you ask kids now, the funny thing is, teenagers, all breakups now are by cell phone, text <laughs> message. Yeah, yeah. So what that means is if you're off line, if you're disconnected, unplugged, away, you don't know what's going on. Right. You're, you're not up to date on things. There, there could be a very important message waiting for you. Just because you're disconnected doesn't mean that you're not implicated. Sure, sure. And you had a great piece in the, in the uh, Wall Street Journal called Why Gen Y Johnny Can't Read Nonverbal Cues in September 2009 uh, in how all this digital the texting particularly uh, it, it essentially inhibits people from picking up on all the nonverbal cues that, that you typically learn uh, when interacting face-to-face. -face. Well, listen, Mark, uh, we can't do j this sub subject justice in 15 minutes, and I'd like to continue this as an ongoing dialogue. Just in, in less than less than 30 seconds, w having written about this and observed this, what do you what do you think the society needs to do to try to reverse the trend and get back to a more sane, uh, you know, sense of learning and sense of hu personal human interaction? The mentors in young people's lives, teachers, ministers, as well as parents, aunts, uncles, older siblings, need to keep pressing home the message: you've got to read books. You've got to read newspapers. You have to engage with intelligent media. You don't have to stop doing Facebook, but you do have to preserve some critical period of time in the day for you to encounter the important things of history, politics, the arts, and literature. And if you don't, it will cost you when you're 30 years old. Mm -hmm. These are not things that are going to help you gain popularity with your friends when you're 17, but they will help you in the job interview when you're 25 years old. They what will help you in the workplace. They will help right. you in any professional school that you enter. But kids today act like they don't need the, you know, they can shirk you off. You're, you're the old fogey. They don't have to listen to you. <laughs> so what, what's your message to all the quote unquote old fogies that try to be mentors or uh, actual teachers? You, you have to play every once in a while the role of the stern Elder, one of our jobs as old people is to rebuke teenagers for their self-absorption, their narcissism, their adolescence, and that's our job. That's what we're supposed to do. That's our responsibility. That's how we pass along a civic and cultural inheritance to the young. And it's good if the young argue back. It's good if they resent it and try to engage with you and win that debate. That toughens them for forensic uh, right. disputes later on in life. But that, that, that's, that's what we're supposed to do. And, and the idea of indulging the young and being friends with them and being hip and being with it and so on, this is an abdication of responsibility. Okay. All right. Uh, well, that's all the time we have today, Mark. I'd like to talk to you about this again at a future occasion. Uh, Dr. Mark Barilon, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this has been Inside Academia with Andy Nash. Check us out next week and every week as we take you for a look behind the Ivory Curtain. Thank you.